So stiff necked people and rebellious people. And he said, Get down off of the mount because he said, I am going to consume them. And we're going to talk about Moses' prayer uh, in just a moment as Moses made intercession uh, for the church that was in the wilderness. We find Moses in this passage of scripture that we're going to read in a couple of other passages of scripture where Moses' great concern was just for himself but he was concerned was for the church in the wilderness, Israel, which was God's church in the wilderness. And Moses was burdened. Basic was willing to have his name scratched from the book of life in order that they might be saved. Let's read some of the accounts of it. In Exodus 33, the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people that you have brought forth up from the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, and the Amorites, and the Hittites, the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the chicken mites, and everything else. <laughs> it says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you. For you are a stiff-necked people, lest I destroy you, on the way. When the people heard these evil tithings, they mourned, and no man put on his armor. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to Israel, You are a stick necked people, and if I should go among you uh, for one moment, I would consume and destroy you. Now therefore, take off thy armaments uh, from thee, that I may know what to do with thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their armaments by the mount of Horeb. Now, we find in verse uh, 14, in verse 13, Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider this nation is thy people. Talking about the nation, God talking about destroying. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not hence. For wherein shall it be known here that, that I and the people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and the people, from all the people that are in the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing, uh, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken 
For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, Moses is praying for something more than personal blessing. Moses was walking under an open heaven with God. God had blessed him. God had spoke to him face to face. God had given him personal revival. But Moses was concerned more for more than that. Moses was concerned for the church. And Moses was concerned about something else that we're going to look at in just a moment. He wasn't just simply wanting blessing. He just wasn't simply uh, wanting the presence of God uh, in the church for his own benefit. But he's wanting to see the honor of God and the glory of God protected. And his primary concern in these prayers was the eternal honor and the eternal glory of God. And so tonight I ask you the question, why pray for revival? Why look for revival? Why want revival? Is it just that we might fill our churches? Is it just maybe that we can be delivered from some of our troubles? Is it that there could be some changes brought about in our life? Or we do, we really want revival in order to see the glory of God. And not only us see it, but the outside world see the glory of God. And God be honored in the church of the Lord Jesus. See, it was the church in the wilderness and Moses had prayed for them and, and he was asking for something more. He had the assurance himself uh, of the promise of God, but Moses asked for more. He prayed for himself, he prayed for the people, and he primarily prayed that God would authenticate the church in the wilderness and the message. And I say there's a great need for that tonight. For God to authenticate the message that we preach. What is our motive in praying for revival? We are the church of the New Testament. And uh, we're a privileged people. And we see word that God has called us from darkness into light. Word that we are God's peculiar possessions. That we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That we're God's representatives. That we're God's ambassador. The Bible declared that we are written epistle known and read of all men. The world judges God, the Lord Jesus, and the church by what they see in us, right or wrong. That's all they know about God. They're not carrying a Bible. They're not studying Scripture. The only Bible they ever read is your life and my life whenever we pretend to be Christians or say that we are Christians, and we are Christians if we are believers in Jesus Christ. But our lives is preaching the only message that many people will ever hear. We're God's peculiar people, God's chosen people, a royal priesthood. As the children of Israel were chosen by God, they were the church in the wilderness. And whenever God said to Moses, Moses, I'll take you, and I'll make a great nation out of you, but I'm through with Israel. I I'm through with the church in the wilderness. Moses said, not so, Lord. He said, if they can't go up, block my name out of the book because I'm not going to go up without them. And then he said in the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus, let me read it to you. Verse 10, Exodus 32, 10. Or 32, 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them that I may consume them, and I will make thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doest thy wrath wax hot against the people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Therefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief he did bring them out to slay them in the mountain and consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against the people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Israel, thy servant to whom thou swarest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and this land that I have spoken of I will give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Now, Moses was a bold prayer, wasn't he? 
I mean, Moses argued with God. Moses took the promises of God and said, God, you can't do it. On the basis of your own promise, on the basis of your integrity. You brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and you promised them the land of Cana, the land that was flowing with milk and honey. You said that their seed would be as numberless as the stars in the heaven and now you're talking about destroying them. said, God, what would the heathen say whenever they saw you destroy Israel out here in the wilderness? Would they think that you had the might and the power to bring them out but that you couldn't bring them in? God, what would the outside world say and what would they say about you if they saw Israel destroyed here in the wilderness? Moses was concerned about the honor of God and the namesake of God. He was concerned about God's glory upon the people that it was going to take to influence the world. And so God said to Moses, I, I'll not go up with you, but I'll send an angel. Moses said, that's not good enough. You know, most of us, if God say tonight, I'm not going to be there, but I'm going to send an angel to minister to you, boy, we'd be thrilled to death just to have an angel. But Moses said, God, nothing's going to satisfy us but your presence. We've got to have you. You know why he said that? Because he said, your presence was going to be the one evidence that we are your people. That's going to be the thing that separates us from all the other nations of the world is the presence of God. And ladies and gentlemen, it's the presence of God in the church tonight that makes all the difference in the world. You know what separates us from every other religion? is God. The manifest presence of God. The glory of God in the church. God's believers are the only ones that have that. Glory be to God for it. So I said, God, your presence is that which separates us from everything and everybody. And folks, it's the presence of God that makes a difference in our congregation. We can have everything in the world without His presence. And we have nothing. We can have it all without His glory. We can have beautiful buildings. We can have great budgets. We can have great programs. We can have all the methods in the world. But if we don't have the manifest presence of God on the church, and the glory of God on the church, it's all for naught. And Abraham said, God, we're your people. Your honor is at stake. Your name is at stake. And therefore, God, you've got to pardon our sins. And you've got to lead us on for thy namesake. I want to turn to the book of, to the book of uh, Psalms. And we find this so often in the Psalms. Psalm 79, verse 9, or verse, verse 8. O oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O oh God, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away our sins for thy namesake. Hallelujah. You know why we ought to be praying for revival tonight? For the glory of God and for the namesake of God in the church. That be, that be that divine operation that would separate us from sin and the world to where it be that different to where the world could see it. The honor of God and the integrity of God and the glory of God in the church. He said, God, pardon our sins and forgive us for thy namesake. Hallelujah for it. Then in Psalms 42, verse 1, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I have gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise for the multitude that kept the holy day. The psalmist here was crying out for God. He said, Lord, God, my, my heart panteth for God as a deer's heart would panteth after the water brook. Because he said continually, all day long, 
They're saying to me, where is thy God? Is the world seeing the God that we preach tonight? Where is the Lord God of Elijah that answereth by fire? We need to pray for revival tonight. Not just for, 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 for provisions. And not just to have problems solved in our life, though I hope all that happens. And it will happen in revival. Not just for personal blessings. But our primary concern tonight ought to be for the glory of God. It ought to be for God's honor in the church. That God would send revival in the church. And that His name would be once again glorified in the church of the living God. That's why we pray for revival. You know, our first concern should be the glory of God and the presence of God, the manifest presence of God in the church. I know God's here tonight. God's everywhere. Can't you go to pits of hell, the Bible says. There are pits and God's there. You could ascend the mountains and God's there. But God's not everywhere in His manifest presence. And the only way that we can know God's there is for God to manifest Himself. We need to know whether or not God's in the midst of us. Our first concern should not be what we often are concerned about. Statistics, figures, figures, methods, finances, programs, buildings, is that not the primary concern of the church of the Lord Jesus? And you can have all of that and no glory. No revival. No manifest presence of God. God not showing up. God not doing a supernatural work. Whenever God said to Moses, I'll send an angel. And Moses said, God, if you go not up with us, if it's not your presence, and your glory is not among us. He kept on asking for more, 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 more. And he finally got to the one thing, the important thing. And that's when he said, then God, show me thy glory. That was the one thing that Moses was concerned about. God being glorified, God being honored, that the nations about them would see that God is in the midst of them. That was so in the Old Testament. When the spies finally searched out Cana, the land, went in and spied the land, Rahab the harlot took them in. You know what she said? She said, we heard about you years ago that God fought your battles, that God won your victory, that God was among you, that God was on your side. And she said, as a result of it, our hearts melted and the people had no spirit. Our men, our warriors had no spirit to fight because we heard God was among them. Isn't that wonderful? If they heard that about our church lately, God's among them. God's fighting their battles. God's there in victory. Have we heard that about our churches lately? That's what Moses was anxious for. He wanted the outside world to know that God was in the middle of them and that God was fighting their battles, that they were marching with God and taking their orders from God. The fear of God. In the book of Acts, the fifth chapter, when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost and played the part of the hypocrite, and God killed them in the church, and they wound them up and carried them out. The Bible said it was noise the brought in the church and out of the church, and there was great fear on the people. You know why there was great fear? Because God was among the people in the New Testament church. And no man did join himself to them. I'll tell you, they didn't want to join that church. God put them in it. Great fear had come upon them. Is there great fear in our community of the judgment of God on sin? Is there great fear of the mockery of the things of God that go on in the world around us? It said that there was great fear in the world and in the church. You know why there was great fear in that church? Well, because God was in the middle of it. 
the manifest presence of God, the glory of God in the church, God supernaturally working. And as a result of it, there was great fear. You know what's lacking today in the church? is the fear of God along with the presence of God. Because I'm going to tell you, when God shows up in manifestation, He'll judge sin. And when God starts judging sin, people will fear. We hadn't really seen the judgment of God like it was in the book of Habakkuk whenever there was wicked running rampant in the streets. And I'll tell you, people's hearts had turned from God and Habakkuk called out to God and said, God, how long, how long? I've cried to you, but Lord, it seems that you hadn't heard and that you hadn't answered prior. How long will it be before you judge sin? It looked like that God would never judge sin. But God said, Habakkuk, judgment's coming. It'll be a judgment that people have never seen before. And whenever you see it, you'll cry out for mercy. When you see me move, I'm going to raise up a pagan heathen nation that's going to, become against, is going to come against Israel. And you've never seen such slaughter. You know the most dangerous place in the world to be? Not just an ordinary Baptist church, but a church where God's working. And there's a presence of God and the glory of God in the church. Along with that will come the judgment of God on sin. Moses was concerned about the church. The whole body. That the body would have revival. About the namesake of God. What happened to Achan whenever... Uh, what happened in, 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 in the book of Joshua chapter 7 when Achan stole the golden wage and the godly Babylonian garment and buried it in the midst of the tent. And judgment came upon them. They lost a number of men. They could not stand before the enemy. Their hearts melted and became as water before the enemy. You know why? They were sent in the camp. And Joshua got down and got to praying. You know what he was saying? He was saying, Oh God, for your name's sake, you've got to give us a deliverance. For your name's sake. Read in the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua. Because he said when the nation hear about what's happened, that we have lost your presence, that we have lost your power, that we have lost your gallants, and that you are no longer in the midst of us, and you are no longer fighting our battles, they're going to environ us or surround us and come in and take us. He said, God, for your name's sake, you've got to do something. And you know, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we ought to be hurt. We ought to be grieved over God being robbed of His honor and His glory in the church. Are you grieved tonight? Are you hurt? Are you like Joshua on his face before God, like Moses on his face before God, and say, God, you've got to do something for your name's sake. The nation about us to know that you're in the midst of us. You're all to authenticate your message by your presence and by your power. God, he said, if you don't go with us, we won't go. We've got to have your presence. Boy, wouldn't it be wonderful sometimes that we'd just shut down long enough, seek God desperate enough, deity honors desperation, and just say, God, we're not going any further without your presence. We've gone as far as we can go. We have no desire to go without you. We have no desire to do anything. Because I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Jesus said, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. And nothing spiritually can be accomplished without Christ. Without the presence of God in the church of the Lord Jesus. We may have a lot of hustle and bustle. We may make a lot of racket, do a lot of things. Take some big offerings, have a good program. But I'll tell you, nothing supernaturally happens without the presence of God. And that ought to be our primary concern tonight. It ought to be our primary concern in this camp meeting. God's presence for Mo Moses' intercession for God's presence and Moses' concern for the church. Moses poured his heart out to God praying for the church, saying, God, I can't go. I have no desire to go without the people. You know, I pastored a few churches. There had been one or two of them. 
that I pastored. If God said, son, I'm taking you on, but I'm going to turn this bunch into hell. And I would have said before, before the day is over. But that's why that I couldn't lead the people any more than what they were experiencing. Moses had such a burden and such a compassion and such a brokenness for the people that he was like the Apostle Paul when he said, I'd be a curse for my brethren's sake. Moses said, God bought my name out of the book of life because I have no desire to go. I don't want to go without them. They're stiff-necked. They're rebellious. They're grievously sinned against you. But God, they're your people. I'm their shepherd. And I don't want to go unless they go with me. Boy, that's a pastor's heart, isn't it? And you know, I just got a pretty good idea a pastor with that kind of heart for his people and be able to lead the church into victory. I don't care how far down they may be, how backslidden they may be, how far in sin they may have gone. I tell you, we can lead them to victory in the Lord Jesus. Intercessory. Oh, how we need an assessor prayer warriors today. I remember in my younger days that in every church, in every community, you'd hear people talk about somebody that mentioned somebody and say, yeah, there's a prayer warrior. That's a real prayer warrior. That's a person that knows how to intercede, how to get with God and how to pray things through and pray churches through and pray, pray revivals through and pray people through. Is that not what we need in the church of the Lord Jesus today? People that can pray through, get to God. And God answer prayer. I think I like David Brenner, the great intercessor that prayed for the Indians. Go out before God in snow, knee deep, and bow before God, lay down in the snow and pray till the snow was melted around him. Died a young man with consumption because he'd so given himself to intercessory prayer, praying for the Indian, but he had revival. Reading some of the biography of Jonathan Edwards the other day, how did he get on his horse and ride out to get off and walk and to pray and meditate on God, he said, for his health's sake. And how while there, God would come upon him and Jesus would be freshly revealed to him. And he said, the glories of Christ and the beauty of Christ and the holiness of Christ. And there an intercessor of prayer would have revival and God would meet with him. Like John Knox, when he was so broken over Scotland, he'd cried, oh God, give me Scotland or I can't live. You know why we're not having revival is we can live without one. You know why we don't see the manifest presence of God? We can live without it. You know why we don't see the glory of God? We can live without it. John Knox said, God, I've got to have you. I've got to see revival or I'll die. I don't want to go on like I'm going. I'm praying for Scotland that you'll give me Scotland. Guys like we'd feel that would pray and God come in and mighty revival. We need some Moses, some David Brainerd, some Jonathan Edwards, John Knox, and Wick Whitfields in our day that'll get with God and pray till revival comes. Forget about ourselves. Quit being so subjective about it. Just to pray for ourselves and start praying for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus. Say, God, do for us what needs to be done for your honor and for your glory. You know, I'd love to see God do something in this camp meeting, something supernatural by a sudden visitation from God, as you so often find in Scripture, would say, suddenly God visited the temple. Would be a sudden visitation from God for God to reveal Himself and manifest Himself that would bring conviction of sin. And folk, if we ever get in God's presence, I'll tell you one thing. There's going to be conviction of sin. And there's going to be repentance. And then there'll be joy and praise and rejoicing in the Lord. But in the presence of God, I think about Isaiah whenever he saw him. Woe is me, for I am undone. It was woe everybody else till Isaiah saw the Lord. And then it was woe is me. John on the Isle of Patmos, when he saw him, he fell as though he was dead. God, hand upon him. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we have lost the miraculous and the supernatural in the church. And worse than that, we're satisfied without it. Where is the supernatural? Where is the wonder? Where is the amazement in the church of the Lord Jesus as it was in the New Testament? Whenever they would meet and rehearse what God had done and go out and turn the world upside down for Jesus and come back the next week rehearsing over what God had done. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it was like that in the church today? Well, wouldn't church be a wonderful place? Wouldn't it be exciting? Wouldn't it be a place that folk 
wouldn't wait from Sunday to Sunday to come, but they'd be wanting to meet every night of the week. 